Dear friends, welcome to another episode of COVID-19 Newsroom uh, of the podcast series of the School of Nicosia, School of Law of Nicosia. Today we're here with Patricia Martin. We're connected with her. She's uh, in the United States. And with her, we're going to discuss a very original topic. And before I get into the topic and introduce it, first of all, let me say hello to Patricia and welcome uh, to today's episode. Thank you so much for inviting me, Christina, and the University of Nicosia School of Law. Thank you, Professor Emilianidis, as well. Thank you. Let me say that yeah. Patricia is an attorney in the United States. She's a very familiar face to us because she was a Fulbright scholar uh, in her university in, back in 2014, 2015. And um, she's also the founder of um, an initiative, a very important initiative and a very well-known in initiative uh, by now, the One Woman at a Time um, initiative, which uh, we will be talking about today as well. Um, before, um, I come to you, Patricia, with um, the more specific um, issues of today's discussion. You can tell us more about all this, the, the initiative specifically and what it's doing. Uh, let me introduce uh, to all these people watching us um, what the topic of today's discussion uh, is going to be. Uh, we will be talking about how this pandemic-related state shutdown has created in our life, in our lives in general, specific experiential human conditions, which mirror loss in human liberties. But in this case specifically, we will be looking at abuse against women, but more specifically at non-physical abuse against women. And an issue that, an issue that emerges uh, is the need and maybe the urgent need in many cases for an expedited filing of such cases via digitally accepted documents. And this is something that Patricia will talk to us uh, in detail about. Okay. Uh, what this presupposes is that legislators know, understand, and appreciate the meaning of abuse and the necessity uh, in national strategies for, uh, for such pandemic emergency relief to include this kind of measure. So, um, Patricia, um, you are an attorney in the United States. Uh, you are... Um, a Fulbright uh, scholar. Uh, you are also a founder of OWAT. Uh, what is the legal basis of your basic premise on which this initiative, OWAT, first declared you can self help uh, your right? of no contact on your own legal, on your own legally. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I would like to, first of all, in segueing into this answer, to say that um, in the United States, um, the focus of human rights um, is embodied in our constitution um, and internationally, it is embodied in international treaties, such as the European Convention on Human Rights. These basic platforms upon which we embark our understanding of no contact per se, um, or 
civil protections for no contact or self-help, your right to no contact, are enumerated in different ways, but they mean the same thing. So when uh, the research began uh, for myself on what it means to self-help the right to no contact, it's interesting that to this day, and I applaud the president of Cyprus because the right to no contact globally now and in various ways throughout the world in various nations in jurisdictions locally in towns and villages and in states in the United States has again been interpreted differently in the manner in which it is life preserving. So today we are now seeing an embracing and a crystallization of self-help, the right to no contact, because it has become now something that is a matter of life and death to flatten the curve of this pandemic, this deadly COVID-19. Now, getting back to what is the legal premise of this, obviously every leader of every country that is being affected by this virus is now asserting their wand to say your no contact with other people is your right to life. And we as government actors have a duty to ensure that your life is preserved. And the way that we are doing that is to impose mandatory laws which require you to have no contact in various ways. And the essential things that are necessary in order for this society to stay alive will be continued. Such as, for example, because our police are our line of first defense against this pandemic, and because our hospitals are our first emergency aid for people who have this pandemic, they're number one. They're the line of first defense. And with that is our courts. Our courts are necessary because with this entire initiative to keep our world alive and to ensure our best defense, which is social distancing for some, stay at home for others, shut down for other nations, and lockdown, such as I believe is the institution in Cyprus. In order for this to happen within our various nations, we have to make sure, of course, that there's a safety net, that there's some sort of, what I would say, safeguards that the nation and its leaders are ensuring people on a day-to-day -day basis are there for them. So getting back to the answer to your question, what is the legal premise behind you can self-help, your right to no contact? It's fascinating and it's imperative on a global level that this has now become the initiative that must take place in order for us to stay alive. On an individual basis, we have an obligation and we are learning it the hard way. We are learning it how it is an individual requirement in order for us to preserve life as a whole, for us individually to recognize that the right to no contact is also the need to preserve the life, the health and the safety of one another. So we as individuals have their part and governments on the global level are making sure that we understand what their part is. And I wanna thank you also for using the word abuse. What a word. And even non-physical abuse is very important. Yes. And because it is still abuse. Yes, now we see, I hope we see, 
that, of course, there are words that we've used in the law, domestic, that limit violence, that limit these global protections, and it's abuse of the law mm -hmm. yeah, of no contact, which is at issue. So that if we abuse these protections, which we are now understanding are essential for life preservation, that we do have to limit our sense of liberty or what we believe is A-OK -okay in terms of our social interactions. And the boundaries of that now have become such that if we cross them, we not only may cause someone else to become affected with this virus, but we may be the reason why they die. Yeah. So given that the world now shares a common state of no contact by various legal mandates to enforce social distancing, lockdown, quarantine, in order to curtail this highly contagious pandemic and flatten the curve that we often hear. Can you describe how this virus, I mean, if, if at all, has altered the general social attitude surrounding what no contact means generally, but also specifically in respect to women? Okay. First of all, we are a people in the world who perceive contact very differently from place to place. What is permissible in one place and accepted as generally the way it is, is completely unacceptable as ever in another place. So I think that the notions that we have in our respective places and nations, our acculturations, our socially societal indoctrinations that we can't escape from have now become very different and have become something that we must accept and adopt as common. I think that the question of how we perceive the interrelationship now between social connections and acceptable boundaries and unacceptable boundaries are subjective ideas of what, what is our privacy and how do we protect our privacy, our own personal boundaries, as well as those which are not necessarily understood by others has now become synthesized because we don't get to decide now. And what this means is that we don't necessarily have the business of other people's privacy. Privacy now in terms of contact, interaction, societal uh, boundaries are now being imposed on us some people may say, I'm shut down. And, but in that scope of being shut down, actually we come to understand our own personal boundaries. I think that they become much more defined because we can't go anywhere to escape them. We can't necessarily interact with other people to not think about whether or not it's socially acceptable. So when we start to take a look at what this condition of the pandemic has exposed, we then come to understand that boundaries are now common. We think of boundaries as separating us, but now we know that boundaries, our personal boundaries, is our responsibility to respect. That's a very common understanding. So when we think about crossing those boundaries and we think about whether or not everyone actually gets it to understand that when we don't do this or we do do that, is it within the realm 
of what is acceptable conduct, acceptable contact. So the right to know contact is really the right to say, I decide what's unwanted contact based on my disposition with you, with you. And that sense of understanding this commonality now of what is a boundary extension should hopefully be something that is understood intellectually, not just by lawyers or not just by judges, but by those who actually are on the front line. Our family members begin with the front line because this is our home. These are the people we live with. These are the people we love. These are the people we care about. But many times the boundaries that are conceived to be acceptable within the family because it's family are really unacceptable legally. So while we may accept what people do to us because they are family or they are loved ones, we think these are not strangers. They don't understand. Well, start understanding. Because when we start understanding within our own homes where we are on shutdown, we then be able to be citizens in a society which understands when we walk out the door, we get it. We get that the way we've interacted in order to survive in our home today is the way we interact with others so that the society survives on a safety and health level when we walk out the door. So we have the macro and we've got the micro. This is what COVID-19 is, 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 is basically branding into our brains now. And it's hard for people to get it, but we got to get it. Yeah. So let me dig a bit deeper into this situation. Um, you have aimed this One Woman at a Time initiative as a means for empowering abused women globally. Through establishment of its mission, Zero Tolerance, abuse, uh, zero tolerance of abuse against women long before violation erupts. The latest reports, however, that relate to the whole coronavirus pandemic, what they indicate is a substantial increase globally in domestic violence cases. I mean, this is everywhere. I mean, we see it in Europe, we see it um, uh, in, in, in countries, um, in, in the US, uh, we've seen it everywhere. And the reason of course being that ironically, uh, the place you're most safe in, your home, is the place where you're locked up with your abuser at the end of the day. So, considering that the parameters are this, this is your state of play. If there is one thing that you could do to help, I mean, with the victims, I mean, to help these victims, what would it be? Great question. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that I could do, or we, I would ask the world to do, actually happened to me this week. Uh, uh, I was uh, looking at Twitter. It was that last week? I was looking at Twitter. And Governor Cuomo in uh, New York put out a Twitter and it said, uh, I am alarmed at how many domestic abuse 
cases are coming at this state while we are in the state of trying to save lives. Uh, and I am putting out this Twitter to say, call this hotline if you are suffering from abuse. So I thought, I'm gonna call the hotline. I called the hotline and the woman answered the phone and I said, I, I, I saw the Twitter from Governor Cuomo and I would like to ask you what you are doing when women call. How are you guiding them? Which is essentially what OWAP does. It guides women to get into court on their own, to self-help the right to no contact, to, to, to end their abuse on their own. And she said to me, we help them understand how to navigate the state website that provides women with forms for getting into court on their own for a civil protection order on an emergency temporary basis in order to shut out the abuser. And I said to myself, thank you. That is the answer to the question. You get five stars and I was happy. And if there was one thing that I think has to happen right now is that the doors to courts must, if they are open, make it very simplified for anyone who is being abused, be they men, women, and children represented by their parents to end the abuse immediately and temporary on a civil basis. Why? Because it can happen immediately when the police are not available, when the hospitals are not available, when there are not enough shelters on the planet for all the abused people who are suffering in their homes. And it is also a deterrent for abuse because if the abuser knows they are gonna be the ones shut out the door in COVID-19, they will think twice. So one thing, don't make it hard. Understand that this is a very common event and it is escalating at a huge level because of shutdowns. So the responsibility on the state on the courts right now is to allow people to enter those doors in the most simplistic way possible. Obviously, in the United States, it's digital. Hearings are done telephonically. This is not rocket science. These are people who must save themselves from harm now. So it's not even a question. It's not a question. It's practically a given that they wouldn't be screaming immediately, help me, I can't go anywhere, please help me. And let's just stop with the noise. Let's accept the word abuse that becomes not just physical, it's threat, intimidation, and harassment, and there are guns in homes. This is, this is commendable. And I mean, what you said about uh, the way the the state of New York is handling it, I mean, this is a first. I mean, I I haven't heard this anywhere else. I mean, this is indeed amazing. Which, which is not surprising to me, considering how generally Governor Cuomo has been handling the whole situation. But yeah, that's just a side comment on the whole situation. So, um, Patricia, let me, um, a final question. Uh, in your experience as a, um, a constitutional uh, uh, lawyer and international human rights uh, lawyer, uh, in both in the US uh, and you also have experience uh, with, the, uh, with the European Union system and, and you also know the Cyprus legal system very well, uh, what would you say in that context um, is the most important legal challenge again ahead 
let me say, for state actors, for legislators, and for lawyers to address now in order to adequately prepare for a day when, hopefully, the pandemic cloud clears. Fingers crossed for that day to come. Yeah, and, and between now and then, of course, um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, I would say that the, um, the major challenges which are presented to uh, individuals who have the power to create change. Um, I would say, first of all, the major challenge, I always begin with the individual. Uh, most people begin at the top, I begin at the ground level. Um, so I would say that the major challenge is this. Our mindsets are that we are the ones who decide what we're going to do on any given day. And uh, we have an understanding of what we think we can do and we can't do. I think that uh, the understanding in terms of the challenge, respecting the preservation of personal boundaries is to understand that the language that we create is understood. We do not have, I don't believe, in most nations, a very clear understanding of what those boundaries are. And the reason I say that is because, for me, the word abuse is very clear. Yet, I don't care where you go. I don't care what, what country. It is, uh, that's not clear to people. They don't understand that when someone says to them, I did not want that person to do this to me, that they don't have the right to say, well, why not? The clarification of knowing that this is a subjective objective decision is for some reason missed the mark in our laws, in illegal interpretation of those laws, the way that legislators write those laws and policymakers advocate for those laws, the way that attorneys say, I don't really see that you have a case here based on their understanding of what it is a case. They missed the point. The point is that when it comes to your physical, personal boundaries, you decide, as long as it's reasonable, what crosses the line. So the biggest challenge is to understand that actually what you think is just perfectly fine is totally not to whoever it is it's directed at. And they, can tell you legally, back off. Back off my boundary. And that's the piece that's a disconnect right now. And I know that it's a disconnect because there's really no reason for you to have to make a huge argument over that issue. Yet repeatedly, people try to tell you you're wrong, that's not the way it is. I don't, I don't agree with you. That's not the law. It's like, no, that is the law. It might not be your law in your head about your personal boundaries, but it's my right under the law to say that this is my right. So we have to, in a challenge, understand that this is subjective, objective, in order for it to be unbiased. And bias is at the core of where 
the mind shift, the mindset needs to be reset. And I say sometimes you can't fill all the cracks and sometimes you just gotta break it and begin again. So Patricia, I mean, thank you for, well, a most enlightening, but also for a most empowering uh, discussion. Uh, I think uh, it was very uh, insightful, helpful, and setting boundaries is very important generally in our lives, but this is also a very sensitive issue as well. And in light of this whole situation that we are living, uh, I think it's also extremely important for victims in this situation to take power in their own hands and realize and react to this situation. So I really do hope that you have inspired people today, that you will inspire Thank people you. as well, because a lot of people will watch this later as well, because it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. It can be watched as a podcast, there's an audio podcast and video podcast, and it's also will also be available very soon as an IT on, on, on Apple Live. So thank you so much for being thank with us. Thank you. Uh, it was a great pleasure and uh, an honor, I would say, for having you here today with us. My, my <laughs> honor. And I honor Cyprus and I honor the shutdown. May you all be all well. Okay. We all should and we should all respect it as well because that's the only way to help at this moment. So, dear friends, this was Patricia Martin with us from Colorado, United States, a native New Yorker who's very worried about her family right now back in New York. Yes. And I truly hope, Patricia, that have everything turns out great. Keep safe. And all our positive thinking are with you over there as well. So... Dear friends, thank you for watching us. Uh, this was another episode of COVID-19 Newsroom from the School of Law of the University of Nancy. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.